that we have a record of our work uh, dealing with this question. And that's why the topic today is the pandemic uh, and the pandemics uh, throughout the world and particularly pandemics and their relationship to Africa. Uh, we, we have a, a large number of people on the program today and I really appreciate all of you uh, coming to this program because uh, it is essential for us as African people, particularly uh, to know what the facts are. Let, let me start as I normally, as you, those of you who know me, you, know, you normally know uh, that I like to start with as much information as possible. Uh, and I want you to just take a note of this. The universe uh, is formed, according to science, about 14 billion years ago, 14.5 to be exact. And the earth was not created at the same time as the beginning of the universe, but it came into being as a creation about 4.5 billion years ago. And the way they know this, of course, is because they have done dating of the rock formations throughout the earth. Some of the oldest rocks found on the earth are in the continent of Africa, and I've seen some of these. In fact, I was just in uh, South Africa uh, just a few months uh, before uh, the closure of, the, of this country uh, and uh, most of this country, and uh, visited uh, some of these places. Uh, so keep that in your mind, that a universe began 14.5 billion years ago, the Earth is created about 4.5 billion years ago, and even dinosaurs disappeared 65 million years ago. The dinosaurs that we like to talk about, that, are, that children like to read about and like to go to the museums and visit the dinosaurs, uh, they disappeared 65 million years ago. They had been on the Earth up until the time of their disappearance, they had been on the earth for 75 million years. So, so, so they were on the earth longer than the time uh, from their disappearance to now, which is 65 million. So, so, so that's the dinosaurs. But hominins, and hominins are actually human-like beings did not come into existence until seven million years ago. Actually, the oldest hominins that we have found are in Africa and in Chad, the country of Chad. Uh, Sahelanthropus chadensis is the fossil remains, the bone remains of that particular hominin. However, the interesting thing about this is that Homo sapiens did not come into being. That is, a Homo sapiens, that's, uh, they, they, what they mean by that, say, uh, humans with uh, uh, knowledge and brains and the ability to think and to rationalize and so forth. So, so if, we, if we talk about that, then what we have to say is that those, that human beings did not come into being did not come into being until uh, 300,000 years ago. 300,000 years ago, we get human beings. And those 300,000 years ago, uh, there have been many uh, different uh, discussions about uh, the human race, so to speak. I mean, after all, we know that until about 70,000 years ago, all the people in the world were black. There are no people in the world who are any complexion but black up until 70,000 years ago. Because Africa is the home of the human race. All human beings living today came out of those Africans. There are no Africa, there are no human beings that dropped out of the sky from Mars. There are no human beings that came to us from Saturn or from some other galaxy other than our Milky Way galaxy. And there's no other continent on the earth where we have as long a history of Homo sapiens 
as we have in Africa. And there is no other continent where we have as long a history of hominins, just human-like figures, except Africa. So, so this is extremely important to know because the first people to call the name of God had to be black people. The first people who named their children had to be black people. The first people, I always like to say, who crossed a, a river or a lake had to be black people. The first people who explored and came to try to understand lightning and thunder and death and birth also had to be black people because there were only people who were around. And that means, of course, that black people were the first people to have to deal with the challenge of epidemics. Now, this is um, uh, going to be very interesting for you because, uh, because it was interesting to me as a researcher and study, a student of, of history and of culture, is that some people don't realize that African people were at the very beginning of, of almost everything that we know, the foundation of knowledge, the beginning of everything that humans have now and that humans see, and that the, the whole concept of the development of the brain, the development of consciousness and unconsciousness must begin with the continent of Africa. But we sometimes think that life was just purely idyllic and that there were no worries that Africans have. And I sometimes hear my brothers and sisters say things like that. Well, you know, they didn't have any worries. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it, you know, Africa was bountiful and abundant and plentiful. So there were no worries. There was there were a lot of chaos in the past. There was a lot of chaos and there was a lot of danger. And the danger um, uh, most often was uh, either from uh, nature itself or from uh, uh, animals uh, that saw uh, that 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 saw human beings as. Uh, 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 those who were prey, I mean, so, so, so we had to be creative to avoid the absolute end of the human race. This was a challenge to Africa. How do you escape the absolute end of your family, your clan, your people? How, how do you escape it? What do you have to think about? How do you, how do you see yourself? What becomes of you is extremely important that we have this understanding. So it's very, very powerful. The, the ex existential dangers to human civilization are, are many, but there are several that I just want to just briefly speak about. And then I want to go get into in depth about these, this notion of pandemics. People talk about threat to human civilization because that's something that you, you, you think about it when you're reflecting. So since we have only been here 300,000 years, which in the history of the earth is very short time. And in fact, we haven't been here as long as the dinosaurs were here. I told you they were here for 75 million years. And in fact, they've been gone for 65 million years. So, so when I say that uh, we've only been here for 300,000 years, that means that there is this danger. And here's what, what I think some of the dangers are. First, global warming. And we don't want to talk about global warming, but global warming is going to be a problem. I went to Antarctica with my wife a few years ago. We were down um, in uh, the bottom of uh, Argentina and Chile uh, in Ushuaia. And then we, we took a boat for two days uh, across the Drake Passage and into uh, Antarctica and made several stops, maybe about nine stops in Antarctica. And what you can see, and people had histories about this, 
the melting of the ice in Antarctica is a danger. It is a present danger to cities like New York, New Orleans, uh, Miami, uh, uh, just a small portion of the melting of that ice will raise the sea levels all over the world. And there will be cities now built along the coast, some beautiful beaches that will be flooded. In fact, if the Antarctica keeps melting, then it will also be inland. It would just not be the coastal cities. So that's an existential threat to human civilization. Another threat is nuclear war. These are things in the hands of human beings. You know, you got all these, you got, you got about 40,000 nuclear weapons throughout the world. In fact, they have the potential of building even more, these different countries. And if an accidental war starts and a nuclear war, human civilization could totally disappear. It'd be gone, that's it, that's a, that's a problem. The, the, the other threat, uh, major threat, existential threat, is biotechnology itself. That's where human beings have made um, uh, nanotechnological items, small technological items, put them into robots, and those robots now emulate human cognition. So you can imagine what could happen with those uh, biotechnological inventions that human beings made, they can turn and in fact destroy human civilization themselves because they have, they have the algorithms that have been given to them by human beings for murder, for death, for killing. They can make machines. That's why you see all of these uh, programs on television with these biotechnological machines. Uh, things that can be uh, killed, you think, and then they come back alive. <laughs> what, what is that? It is because they don't have soul. They don't have spirit. There is no sense of values here. This is, this is all coming from a patriarchal racist society, a hierarchical society. Can you imagine if human beings who have limited values give these algorithms to robots, then the robots will be running mad. So that's, a, that's an existential threat to humanity and to human civilization. Volcanic explosions, like the one that happened in Sumatra 75,000 years ago, which caused there to be a blanket of dust around the earth for several years that cause uh, plants to die and animals to die. Uh, volcanic explosions, I mean, the, the possibility, for example, of Yellowstone exploding. People talk about going to Yellowstone and see the geysers. But do you know that 80, that when you see the geysers, you're just seeing uh, a few of the uh, symptoms of a very powerful, very powerful volcano. And that 80 mile wide volcano at Yellowstone one day could possibly blow up. And in fact, that's the end of humanity. Uh, that's the end for, the, um, uh, for human civilization. So then the, the, the next one is meteorite destruction. We can have meteorite destruction, meteor, meteors can uh, hit the earth and the human civilization disappears. We could have a supernova explosion. That is where a star blows up in the universe. And that's the end of humanity and the end of human civilization. I'm giving you this background so we can have a clear understanding and conversation. Because if we don't have this background, we won't have a clear understanding about epidemics and pandemics. Uh, epidemic simply means infectious disease at a particular place at a particular time. You can have an epidemic of a disease. You, this is why they used to have, uh, uh, we used to talk about uh, epidemics of uh, polio, it's epidemics. It could be in a particular place, it could just be one country, it could be in one section of a country, one region of a country. But a pandemic, 
A pandemic means a global outbreak of disease. Now, a global outbreak of disease is something that in the old days, in the old time, people used to call a plague, or they used to call pestilence. You know, say, wow, boy, a pestilence has struck. The, uh, the, the, the concept of the pestilence comes from uh, the word uh, uh, pesta, uh, which, which means simply uh, a plague, which means something that is, that is so destructive that uh, people just don't know what to do. It's, 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 it's awful. So there have been some major pandemics in the world. And I just want to give a few of them. Then I want to talk about what people do, how people react to them. I want to talk about how we react to what is going on right now with COVID. But, but you got to have this background. Let's take this. In the, um, it, it probably, I'll give you just a few of them, right? In, in about 480 BC, that is uh, about four, say 500 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, uh, Thucydides, who was a philosopher and writer and leader, uh, in Athens, uh, was uh, writing about what had happened in Athens. And here's what he said. He said something like this. People in good health were all of a sudden attacked by violent heats, fevers in the head, and redness and inflammation in the eyes, the inward parts, such as the throat or the tongue, becoming bloody and emitting an unnatural and fetid breath. This was 500 BCE, one of the earliest times somebody was writing about a plague. And this was the Athenian plague. This is what happened in that plague. It was a scary plague. Now let's, let's look at the, what they call the White Death. The White Death was called the bubonic plague by some people. That happened in the year 1390 and uh, to around 1450. This is about the time actually of the Mali Empire in West Africa. The, the, but the White Death had very limited impact on Africa, but it basically killed a third or more of the people who were alive in Europe. 70 million people died because of the bubonic plague. That lasted not just one year, it lasted from 1390 to 1450. That is 60 years they had to deal with this bubonic plague. And it was not over, it was not finished. I'll show you, tell you in a minute. But, but that's the, that was, that was, they say that was the plague of all plagues. This was the white death of 1390, 14. 50, 70 million people died. And what caused it? Fleas and rodents. A bacteria called, called Yersinia that infected fleas and rats and became droppings and stuff in people's food. It changed the whole culture of Europe. People started using forks and utensils, wooden utensils at that time because they had never used utensils before. They were just people eating with their hands. People didn't wash their hands or anything. They changed the whole nature of the culture. People didn't take baths. Europeans lived without taking baths because it was too cold in many places. So they had, they had to change their entire civilization and say, wait a minute. We can't do, we can't live like this. We've got to do something because of that. And then another big one was 1918. This was the, uh, they called it the Spanish flu, but it really came out of Kansas. Most people don't realize that. The Spanish flu was, was only called the Spanish flu because the Spanish people were the only people who were really keeping uh, exact records at the time. Because you remember this was coming after uh, the so-called uh, this is the uh, first international European war. And so this 
this particular flu, this uh, 1918 flu, killed 50 million people. Now, what I study this about, what I study these uh, pandemics about, is to see how humans react. You know what the reaction was? People went to church and prayed, and then other people demonstrated. But neither prayer nor demonstrations could stem the tide of the so-called Spanish flu. It destroyed 50 million people. Now, you know what the aftermath of that was, though, because of the impact on even this society, the United States? One of the largest outbreaks of racist riots and attacks against Black people in the history of America. The 1919 riots, when basically white people, because of the, because of the condition of people economically, uh, and, and the illness and the sickness of the people, many of them turned on African Americans. So I tell you this because I want you to understand history. History is important for us. If we don't understand this, I'm telling you, you do not know what we're dealing with. We're dealing with some people who say, well, you know, I'm invulnerable. And people tell you stuff like that. I'm invulnerable. You know, it, doesn't, it just attacks black people. <laughs> no, no. No plague makes any distinction in terms of class, color, creed, gender, anything. No, no, no pandemic anywhere has ever done that, has, has ever made those distinctions. In 1540 to 1749, perhaps one of the most important pandemics in the Americas happened. And of course, People don't normally like to remember bad things, so we don't write about this in history so much. What happened between 1540 and 1749? Europeans coming to the Americas brought plagues. They brought smallpox, they brought syphilis, they brought the, the so-called uh, uh, white plague, the white death, bubonic, and other diseases. What did these diseases help them do? They destroyed the indigenous people. They destroyed the Incas. They destroyed the Aztecs. They destroyed the Cocalitzli. 35 million people in South America and North America were destroyed by virtue of the European explorers coming to America and to the Americas and bringing these diseases with them. We don't write about that. It's rare people write about those pandemics. And look at, look, at the, look at the London bubonic plague in 1665. In 1665, in April of that year, the plague hit London and it went rapidly through the hot summer months. Fleas from plague infested rodents were one of the main causes of the transmission from people to people, from person to person. By the time the plague ended, about 100,000 people, including 15% of the population of London had died. 100,000 people. We, we're getting close to that in the US right now. We are, we're close to 90,000 with the COVID already, you see? And, and but people, but then what happens is after a few years, people forget. People, people don't remember. It's like people don't remember. I mean, there, there are very few people who are alive in 1918 when we had that uh, that big outbreak of the 1918 flu. In, in fact, uh, my, my father was born in 1919, and so a, a year after that uh, that outbreak, so very few uh, very few people are alive who remember that outbreak, who know it. So we've forgotten it, and we even forgot the reaction of the society to it. The same happened in London in 1665. In 1720, then the Great Plague hit Marseille in France. And it started when a ship docked in Marseille carrying a cargo of goods that, were, that was filled with rats. And those rats were let out throughout the city and they all had plague, you see? It's just simple as that. 
But here's the one that I wanted to talk with you about before I start getting into Africa. It is the Russian plague of 1770, 1772. And I've, um, you know, I must tell you that uh, in, uh, in February, I was in Moscow. And when I was in Moscow, one of the things I wanted to do was to find out the history of black people in Moscow, because uh, some of the most prominent uh, figures in the black world uh, have been there, all there, the images are there. Uh, 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 Pushkin, the great poet, uh, Alexander Pushkin is sort of a national hero of Russia. And you see his huge statue uh, in uh, near the Red Square. And, and, you, and you see Lumumba's uh, statue. So, so you, you, you want to know what, what has gone on in this country. So I, I read, I didn't know very much about the history of Russia. So I read no Russian history. But look at this, this is one of the most telling events because it was also reported widely. In 1770 to 1772, the Russian plague, which was really called the Moscow plague, ravaged the city of Moscow. The terror of citizens, the terror of the citizen because they were quarantined the government said, hey, you know, you can't be going out talking to people. You can't be assembling with people because you're spreading the disease. So people, when they were quarantined, they erupted into violence. They said, no, you're not going to keep us home. We're going to go out. We're going we're gonna to be with each other. This is 1770. I'm telling you, you go check your history. Read it. Read about this. The Moscow Plague. Riots spread throughout the city of Moscow, and it culminated in the murder of Archbishop Ambrosius. He was the Archbishop of the Orthodox Church. And what he said to the people, he said, you know what? Don't, don't gather. Don't even come to church. But I heard a lady not long ago here in the U.S., in Ohio, they asked her about the COVID. And she said, well, you know, I've been washed in the blood of Jesus. Nothing can touch me. That's a part of irrationality. You see what I'm saying? And this is what Ambrosius was saying, the archbishop was saying to the people in Moscow. He said, we get together, people are coughing and sneezing, and they're just spreading this disease. Don't come to worship. You know what they did? They murdered him. They killed him. Catherine who later was called Catherine the Great. She was the leader. She moved many factories and businesses. She told them, you know, you can't be in the city of Moscow. You have to go out and build your, have your manufacturing outside the city because they thought that maybe it was manufacturing. Well, the fact that she did that, even though 100,000 people had died, there was an insurrection. And the insurrection occurred because people said, no, I am not going to obey this. This is not something that I know, that I know that this is, and, and of course, lots of more people died. Here in Philadelphia, where, where I am right now, giving this talk. In Philadelphia, in 1793, we had one of the worst outbreaks in the United States of America of yellow fever. George Washington's second inauguration at Congress Hall in Philadelphia was March the 4th, 1793. And it was like hell right in the midst of all of this chaos of this incredible yellow fever epidemic that hit the city very hard. Thousands of people died in Philadelphia. It was, the United, it was the capital of the United States of America. And, 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 and you know what the white officials told people? Black people can't get it. Black people can't get uh, yellow fever. Black people are immune. And, and as a result of it, many uh, abolitionists, white abolitionists, as well as black progressive told the people of African origin in Philadelphia, you need to be nurses to the sick white people because you can't get it. Richard Allen, because of his values and morals as a man and his character, he even led a campaign saying, you know, we got to help these white people. They say we can't get it. 
And what happened was that black people began to die, just fall, just just die like flies, because they did get it, and that was a terrible thing. So I'm not going to go through many more of these, but to say that there there've always been this um, this situation in in in, in the world actually in terms of human beings having to confront these things, whether it was the Hong Kong flu, uh, the swine flu, Zika, uh, other kinds of things, and uh, the Antonine plague, uh, the, 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 the biggest plague perhaps that hit Africa was in 250 and 271, uh, this era, and that was at Cartadas, uh, which hit both Cartadas uh, what, what they call Carthage, and also Egypt, Waset. Um, and uh, it, it is said that millions of people died. And you can, you can of course, uh, see evidence of this today. Now, I'm giving you all this background to say that these were not the only examples, I mean, of, of plagues, but to tell you what happened and how people responded to them. So now let me just tell you what my argument is, and, and, and then we'll, we'll talk about, uh, we'll, we'll talk specifically about African uh, situations themselves and how we re relate to them. Um, my, my position is this, that when we study, and as I do, as you know, I was gonna show you a copy of my book, but you, you know my book, The History of Africa. And it's the first, Comprehensive History of Africa written by an African. And, and now it's in its third edition, The History of Africa. And many people who've come to the Malefic Heti Asante Institute and those who are at Temple University in my classes, you, you know this book. But there are a lot of people who don't know the book. But uh, in, in this book, I talk about some of the situations of our history. And part of it is that uh, there were, in uh, ancient times, not too many written records. So, so if you start looking at the oldest cities in the world, you have to look to Africa. This is where you get the oldest cities in the world. And I, and I say this to you because uh, out of a great sense of humility about uh, our history without trying to uh, necessarily put Africa forward because you don't have to do it the historical record speaks for itself that the cities in southern africa were perhaps the earliest human settlements that we have stone records of where there are still evidences ruins of those cities some of them as old as 75,000 years old remember i told you that Homo sapiens rose about 300,000 years ago. So, so 75,000 years is not even half that period, but it's a long time. There, there's nothing else comparable to this. And when you start looking at that history, you can then understand why the stone history, particularly of Southern Africa, is so important and so valuable. Because a place like uh, in Salo, uh, Ilanga, a place where I visited with my good friend and, uh, and, and son um, in uh, academics and, and scholarship, uh, Simpi Wei Sisanti, uh, um, last year, was so overwhelming and, and overpowering to go there and to see that human beings thousands of years before Egypt had already constructed stone monuments and ritual elements in honor of the ancestors and in reverence to the ancestors. It's, it, it's the most powerful thing. But what was important to me to understand was then I understood uh, places like Guisho, uh, Mapungwebwe. Uh, I understood Quina. I understood slow, slow. I understood all of these places that we know existed because there are ruins of them, but they've disappeared. 
You know, Basil Davidson, whom I had the pleasure of meeting when I was younger, he had written many books on Africa. He was a Britisher who probably was the leading progressive in terms of African history uh, in Britain and maybe one of the leaders in the world, actually, with a man with a beautiful heart and a clear understanding of human history and the uh, contributions and achievements of African people uh, and the strength and energy of African civilization and culture. Uh, but he, he, had, he had written a book called The Lost Cities of Africa. And in this book, it gave me an interesting idea. And this is the idea that I put forward with this pandemic of COVID. And the idea is that when you look at places like Guisho or Mapungubwe, uh, or Insalo in Elanga, or the great Zimbabwe is a good, a good example. Well, what happened to this great city that existed? We know it existed from the 11th century to the 14th century because it traded with China and it traded with the Portuguese. What happened after that? It was not, it was not seen again by outsiders until 1800s. So what happened? This is my thesis. My thesis is that pandemics are endemic to earth life that pandemics come and pandemics go. And that in the case of these great cities of Africa, before there was written records, with the exception of some records that I will talk about, they, we don't know what happened to these cities. It's almost like the people vanished. So what does that do? It gives space for people to have conspiracy theories. It gives space for people to make crazy arguments like, oh, you know what? Uh, the people who built Great Zimbabwe came from Mars. Or, hey, you know what? They were aliens who built these. They, black people didn't build a civilization. The people who built Nzalo Elanga can't be black because black people can't do that. They must, be, they must be somebody who came out of space. And they have theories like that. Even the people recent, recently, there's a book called Adam's Calendar. A guy, a guy, they just make up stuff, all kinds of stuff about African civilization. Because what they are trying to do, their speculation is that it's not possible for black people to do it. My speculation is pandemics. And that is the key, that if it is pandemics, then we don't have records because then we know that there are important elements in history that are missing and pages that are missing. And part of what our uh, epidemiologists must do and part of what our people must do is we must begin the process of deep understanding of pandemics so that we can explain uh, what happened to our civilizations. Because in some cases, I am sure pandemics came and if a pandemic comes to an isolated uh, uh, fortress community and wipes all the people out, there's no record of that, except the records that have been written or drawn on the cave walls uh, by many of our ancestors that people still are in the process of doing some uh, uh, under, uh, 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 attempt to analyze. And I have been doing some of that work myself. It's extremely important for us to understand these rock engravings that we see that we don't necessarily consider uh, in a Eurocentric way as writing, but may very well be evidence of people explaining a pandemic that has happened to our African ancestors. Memory, legends, myth, all of these things have to be looked at and we have to do this without looking at what I call extra rational explanations. We have to look at very clear uh, uh, explanations. And that means that we have to gain a sense of victory over fear uh, and, and victory over ignorance. And if we have victory over ignorance, victory over fear, then in the end, we, we may not necessarily defeat COVID, 
but we can live with it like we have lived with HIV for so many years. And I mean, HIV killed 25 to 30 million people. And now, because of the vaccination, because of the medicine, people can live with uh, HIV and uh, never infect other people. So there, there, there are many, many ways that we deal with it, but we've got to deal with the fear first. And then we've got to deal with just, well, you know, the pestilences will be here. This in inevitability of pestilence, you see? And, 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 and pestilence, when it comes, it destroys many things, many fabrics. Our society will be different. Just like when the uh, White Death, the bubonic plague hit Europe, it ended the feudal age. There was no longer uh, you know, feudal people gathering together, singing on these uh, big, uh, as big uh, serfs, as serfs on these uh, uh, big plantations that they had, you see? It was a different thing. So we have to do that. And I just want to say finally uh, in, in my, uh, my conversation with you that I hope that you will listen uh, next week uh, to our, our lecture next week. And we will, uh, uh, in that lecture, uh, we will also be going further. And this is our first one. So what we're trying to do in this first one is try to understand and appreciate uh, this whole situation of how to use Zoom and, and how to give you a much uh, better uh, experience about knowledge. And uh, at this time, what I'm going to, to do is to see whether or not we uh, can open up for you to see if there are any questions. I know there are already um, some questions in uh, chat. Um, and I appreciate all the congratulations and the comments that you have written uh, in chat. And I want to just... Um, uh, thank the over 100 people who attended today. Let me see here. Uh, I don't, uh, okay. Uh, chat, let me just see if I can open up chat for you here. I have to, there's something, okay, let's see here. Okay, I think, okay. All right, I think I can do it now. So we'll take a, a few minutes, okay? And then we'll have it. Okay, let's see here what's happened here. Chat. Oh boy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, everybody. Wahida. Uh, okay. I want to also ask people, just someone just gave me a message that uh, the, the anatomy of a renaissance uh, is going to be on Saturday at 1 p.m. Uh, by heading to, you just go to Even, Even Bright, and you will get the information about the anatomy of a renaissance, and that, that's Afrocentricity International. Uh, and uh, let's see. Uh, okay, the next time I will try to stream. That's good. Someone has asked me that. Um, okay. Um, uh, Shakur Africanas. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. So, are uh, there, okay, I think that's, uh, okay, Habiba. Um, okay, so I'm, I hope that you were able to hear. Uh, okay, yeah, okay, they were unable to hear. This was early on, they were, people were unable to hear. But I think most of you were able to hear. Can you raise your hand? Were you able to hear me? Okay, so, so most people were able to hear me, uh, and I really appreciate all of you who have come to this lecture, and I, I respect you, appreciate you very much, and uh, hope that uh, uh, Dr. Na, good to see, see you, some of my colleagues, okay, uh, Tariq. Okay, so it's very good to see y'all, and it's wonderful to uh, be able to uh, see Brother Junius and, um, and, and uh, oh, Michael Cord. Uh, this, is, this is very, this is very empowering uh, to see all of you, and and I just want to thank you, Kamika. Uh, you know, people that I and Albert Sutton, uh, Al, brother Al, and I work a lot on Sudan. Uh, happy to see him. And uh, okay, so uh, uh, this is very, very, very empowering. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, we had uh, 117 people today. And I just would like to give you one more announcement that 
uh, that the questions, um, if you have questions on the chat, I'm, I'm, my producer's giving me, so. are there questions? Okay, there are questions. I'm sorry. I, I thought there were no questions. Okay. Okay, somebody finally got on. Okay, just one minute. Let me just try to answer a few. I thought there were no real, no deep questions. Um, okay. Okay, that's a good question. Okay, I see there's a lot. Of, okay, let me just, I can't answer all of them, but I'll do as, as much as I can, okay? Um, okay, uh, so somebody asked me about the discrimination in places like China in the era of this epidemic. I, I, I agree that that is something certainly needs to be dealt with. And it's, it's a shame to see a video of Africans being uh, beat up in the streets of uh, big cities in China. And I, I certainly don't think this is the policy of the Chinese government, but certainly there are Chinese races, just as there are Arab races and European races and races against black people in many parts of the world, including in the United States of America. So we, we really um, have to uh, not only protect ourselves, but we have to be more vigilant and, uh, and, and speak up in, on, on situations like that. And I think people are doing that. What is the Afrocentric, okay, that's the Afrocentric take on China. So then someone asked, um, uh, okay, somebody from Paris, France, uh, yeah, um, uh, we, we, we can follow, now I like this, the person from Paris said that they wanted to let us know that they can now follow us from Paris, and that is beautiful. Do, do, uh, okay, that, that is good. Uh, then um, it was very interesting, and, and okay, that's just a comment. Why does it seem that blacks have been the scapegoats like we are susceptible and have spread the disease at hand. I think the reason that we are, we are uh, scapegoats is because we have allowed ourselves not to defend ourselves. And so consequently, uh, people assume that if you, you're weak, like uh, uh, you, you, you allow people to run over you, to, to, uh, to step on you, uh, that you must be the cause of their problems. In fact, this is where conspiracy theorists come in again. That in China, even though we know that either the disease came to the west coast of uh, the United States from Wuhan, whether it was from the meat markets or, or from a laboratory, whatever, wherever it came from, uh, the Chinese believed that black people brought it. So, so, so we've had this, we've seen this picture before, whether it was with the Ebola, or whether it was with the um, HIV, all of these are things that reflect actually class orientations as well as race orientation. So we have to speak to that. That's why Afrocentricity is fundamental uh, ideological position that says that African agency is necessary. We have to speak for ourselves and speak our own special truths, as Maulana Karinga uh, has, has often said. Um, and we also have uh, uh, Phil Cuffey. Uh, Phil Cuffey asked a, a, a question um, that it is important, he says, uh, what can each of us do uh, to protect us against COVID-19? Well, I think I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a scientist. I'm, I'm not a preacher. I'm not the son of a preacher, son of a scientist. Uh, I, I, so I don't give those kind of advices, but I do say this that what I have heard is that you need to wash your hands, uh, you need to disinfect, and you need to wear a mask. And, uh, you know, and I think that these are things that we can all do. And I think that that's important. Uh, and I think somebody um, uh, that uh, have been listening to this have said many, many things that this will be on the, on the YouTube, and it will be put on the YouTube uh, by my grandson. Uh, later on tonight. Okay, uh, blacks have been, okay, so let me just see if I can get a couple of more and then I will, I will, I think we'll be done. Um, you can call on them and have them, okay, <laughs> okay. I didn't know that. Thank you, Wahid. Uh, okay, uh, okay, the, the Zimbabwe, Natasha from Zimbabwe, uh, yeah, of course they would say that we didn't build, uh, 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 great Zimbabwe because uh, they have a, a, 
a negative attitude about African people and about African intelligence. But, but that's only because of colonialism and only because of ignorance. I mean, after all, I mean, uh, one could certainly look at many things in Europe and ask, well, who, who built these? Couldn't be these white people that I know, you know, who walk around here with their ignorant uh, ideas and commentary about this or that. I mean, you think Trump could have built this? You know, no. So you, people have these kinds of thoughts, but uh, these thoughts have to be based in reality. And I think that that's a big problem. So I thank you very much and um, be safe, be sound, be strong, and, and know that it's important uh, for us to uh, uh, take care of our health and take care of ourselves. And I will see you again next week. Hotel. <laughs>